everyone. I'm Andy Greenspan. Um, I'm a director of college advising at International College Counselors. Uh, we um, help students get into college. Um, I think we do it quite well. We believe that um, there's a great college out there for basically everyone and anyone. Uh, but today we are fortunate uh, to talk uh, to the dean uh, of one of the very best uh, colleges in journalism uh, in the country, that is the Medill School of Journalism at Northwestern University. And I say that because I am a bit partial. Um, you are dealing with three Medill uh, diplomas here. Uh, <laughs> Dean Charles Whitaker, what a pleasure it is to have you here. Um, I uh, graduated from Medill in 1978, and uh, Dean Whitaker uh, went both undergraduate and graduate. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me, Andy. Um, and I hope that we will have um, a thoughtful discussion uh, about journalism in college admissions and how uh, young journalists can uh, prepare themselves uh, for Medill, although uh, Dean Whitaker has already sort of forewarned me there is no clear and smooth path. Uh, before we do that, I do want to give folks a little bit of history about Medill. Uh, you're coming up on your 100th year. We are. February 8th, 2021. We will celebrate the Medill centennial. Wow. Amazing, amazing. And how are you going to do that? I guess you're going to invite all- We had all these grand plans <laughs> for a year-long celebration in multiple cities, and uh, we are reevaluating those as we speak. <laughs> no, no kidding. Um, so I had originally sort of intended to make this a, a fairly wide-reaching discussion about um, your role and how journalism has changed um, and admissions and the future of journalism. And then George Floyd's death happened. And um, I think to begin this conversation, uh, we would really be remiss uh, without sort of um, dealing with um, what's happened uh, to America and how journalists are covering it. You see on the screen, I just learned this, I think yesterday, uh, Medill alumnus Omar Jimenez from CNN was arrested last week, as many know. So uh, Charles, you take over and tell us what you think is happening out there. What do I think is happening? Well, you know, uh, on the one hand, I'm, I'm incredibly proud of a lot of the work that journalists are doing. They are standing on the front lines of these protests, trying to uh, give us an accurate account of what's happening in the streets and capturing the outrage, um, but also the kind of out of control nature of a lot of the, the protests. Omar Jimenez, um, as the slide says, was a, a, grad, a 2015 graduate who works for CNN. He's um, one of their chief bureau reporters um, in Chicago, but was dispatched to Minneapolis to cover the first outbreaks uh, and, and the, uh, the first protests there. While doing a routine standup, um, a group of state troopers came up and um, started arresting him. I mean, he, it was, he was doing a live shot at the time and he asked, you know, what am I doing wrong? And they sort of didn't talk to him. And he said, would you like me to move? He was tr very calmly, he, he showed such poise and composure at this moment. Um, you know, would you like me to move someplace else? And they never said anything. And they kind of, you know, take his microphone, place him in handcuffs and cart him away for reasons that still um, are unclear. We still have no idea why he was arrested at that moment. And he and, and his entire crew, it was him, a, a, a photographer um, and a producer were all arrested and taken in. Um, CNN uh, uh, President Jeff Zucker quickly got on the phone to the governor and they were released in a couple of hours, but it was still a startling um, occurrence and it was sort of odd to see. I'm sure in your day um, and 
our days were about the same um, chronologically, um, there was, we always felt a certain immunity um, as if we were somehow, at least in the United States, obviously not necessarily in third world countries, but we were cloaked behind the privilege, the sacred privilege of being a reporter and um, that we could report and police would not bother us and protesters would respect us. What's changed? Well, I, I actually did have an occasion. I covered the um, Overtown riots in Miami um, when I was a reporter for the Miami Herald and actually did have police fire tear gas at me and a report at a photographer um, during the course of covering those. But I think, yes, for the most part, you are correct. We did sort of feel as though um, we were immune and that we were sort of shroud cloaked in the First Amendment and kind of shrouded from um, the uh, events that were happening on the streets uh, in, in moments like this. And I think what's changed is fundamentally, um, there's a general distrust and disregard for the media on all sides. I think that is true on the left and the right. I think we are not um, held in high regard. Um, I think all of the public opinion of polls, the polls sort of suggest that. Um, in some ways, I think we're complicit. In some ways, I think we have not done a particularly good job of evangelizing for the importance of media, for the importance of having a free and unfettered press, and people don't understand our processes. I think people often don't see, particularly communities of color, often don't see themselves depicted um, fairly and accurately in the media. I think um, people in authority don't like the fact that we question authority and, and that makes them uh, uh, come after us as well. So. so so one thing I was going to ask you and as we sort of segue here because we could spend an hour on this subject but um, is, is given uh, the uncertainty and, and the fact that being a reporter in America is, is at times fraught with danger have you thought about introducing some element of that to the Medill curriculum? So we have. We actually have a course in, in conflict coverage right now. Um, we used to only give it to the graduate students because we send our graduate students. We have a graduate program now in which we dispatch students kind of throughout the world. Um, we have students who actually were in Puerto Rico following Hurricane uh, Maria. Um, we've sent students to uh, South Africa and other places, not necessarily hot spots, but places where they should be prepared to cover conflict should it arise. Um, we have now pushed that course down into the undergraduate program as well, and we'll be requiring all undergraduates to take it just so that they have a sense of how you you know, we, we have a tendency to parachute in these settings not being fully prepared. We want to make sure that students are fully prepared when they go into these settings, so that they understand the best practices, both for safety, but also um, garnering the respect of the people that you're covering. How long has that pro uh, program been in effect? So we, again, we've been doing it in the graduate program for about five years and it actually came about because one of our um, alums, James Foley, was killed by the Taliban yeah. and um, his parents created this curriculum for us, worked with uh, some other journalists to create this curriculum for us and so the Foley's actually help to develop this for us and with us. So again, we've been doing it with graduate students, but this year, actually, we will now um, introduce it into the undergraduate curriculum as well. So you have been <clears throat> teaching since 1993. I have, um, very old man, yeah. <laughs> and I imagine, I was telling you before we started that when I was at, at Northwestern in, in Washington, I was walking around Capitol Hill with this tape recorder that yeah. got, you know like another person on my shoulder mm -hmm. yeah pounds and now everything is much more mobile and we can move with greater agility yeah. uh, but beyond those technological advances how would you say your teaching and the teaching of journalism has evolved in a quarter of a century I mean, there's so many ways. Um, first, if, if we just deal with the technology, I mean, I think when I was in 
in Medill, when I was a student in Medill, when you were a student in Medill, um, the curriculum was pretty balkanized. You were a print reporter or you were a broadcast reporter. Those were kind of the two things that you were. And we essentially taught writing, reporting, and editing. Um, those were the basic skills, you know, either for, for print or broadcast. Um, we now teach, and, we, and some photography. We've never been a strong photography school, but we do, we do, do and always have taught some, some still photography. We now teach writing, reporting, editing, coding, website building, um, all sorts of back end stuff because it's important that students, and, and, and students now are platform agnostic. When I was a student, I, I never saw myself nor desire to be a broadcaster. I, I don't have a face or voice for broadcast. Um, I would disagree with that. <laughs> we can debate that later. But um, um, I knew that I wanted to be a, a writer and I never had to pick up a camera or think about picking up a camera. No student leaves now without some understanding. Every student has to be camera ready. Every student has to sort of be prepared to do some sort of stand up. They again have to know a little bit of coding so that they can prepare their own websites and kind of publish themselves. And so we do all of that in the same amount of time. The, 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 the amount of time that we have students in school has not uh, grown any, um, but we're trying to give them, provide them with all of those skills in the same amount of time. So that's changed. Yeah. We also talk about our responsibility to our audiences differently. And, and we've been pushed on this by students. Meaning, um, again, I talk about parachuting into a setting, um, being not particularly prepared, thinking just about their story and not thinking about the impact that that story has on the community, particularly vulnerable and marginalized, marginalized communities. We talk a lot more about that, about what it means to um, come into a community, disrupt it with your presence, and then push stories out. We talk about cultural competency when you're reporting in settings that um, that you're not familiar with um, and what does that mean what that means um, so there's a conversation around um, the responsibility that you have as a journalist to the audience not again and not just to the audience but also to the people that you are covering and that's a conversation we never had when I was a journalism student so in my day, and probably in yours, these two gents up on the screen were uh, people we aspired to be yeah. in one way or another. Uh, for those uh, youngins who are listening mm -hmm. in, they are known as Woodward and Bernstein. Um, that is not Robert Redford and Dustin <laughs> Exactly, and Dustin Hoffman. Right. And they helped to bring about the resignation of President Nixon. And so my question is, in my day, those, those were our, our models, our heroes. Mm -hmm. Who are young journalists aspiring to be today? Oh, that's a, yeah, that's a really good question. It's kind of all over the map. I mean, um, it's everyone from, um, you know, Tanahasi Coates um, and, and uh, investigative reporters. Um, uh, uh, you know, we just we just had it's fresh in my mind just because uh, we were having a conversation with them. But Brian Rosenthal was one of our um, alums who just won uh, the Pulitzer for investigative reporting this year. Um, they're aspiring to. There, there are a lot of students who aspire more to platforms and storytelling types as opposed to particular journalists. I mean, I don't know that there, there are that many um, towering, there are a lot of towering journalists, but I don't know that the students necessarily think and see themselves in those roles, largely because the media is changing so much that they don't know that those roles will exist for them in the way they did for people who are, uh, who, for the people who perceive them. So. So a lot of students are listening right now who are, or, and parents, who are aspiring journalists and who I'm sure would love to go to Medill or maybe Columbia. <laughs> Columbia doesn't have a graduate journalism program, however. That is true. <laughs> you know that. Uh, but I'm in a, a master's frame of mind. I need to go back to an undergraduate frame of mind. But Missouri certainly does. Yes, and Missouri does. does interesting program. Um, and I know that, that as Dean of Medill, you don't play any role 
in determining who gets in to Northwestern and therefore Medill. But certainly you have an understanding of what it is Northwestern slash Medill is looking for in students who are checking the journalism box in their application. Yes. And what yeah. So, you know, first and foremost, we're looking for good students, right? So there are those, you know, obvious markers of what makes a good student, right? Good test scores and, and good grades. There are a lot of students who fit that bill. And then after that, they're looking to see what makes you a special member of your community. What have you done to distinguish yourself in the community in which you reside, whether your school community, your neighborhood, the world, if you will. Um, uh, and then how will you apply that as a member of the Northwestern community? Um, and they're also looking to see, you know, they are partial to people who really want to be a part of the Northwestern community as well. So expressing that, you know, you understand the uniqueness of Northwestern and the Northwestern experience, and that's why you have applied, is also good. They're looking for essays that say something about you as a person, what your values are. Um, for Medill, um, a journalism background is important, but not essential. Um, so when I was a Medill undergraduate, I would say 70% of the class was um, editor of their high school paper or yearbook. Um, I think that that is far less true now. We actually, a lot of our students are editors of the of their high school uh, newspaper and, and yearbook, but, or, or television station. Um, or website, but um, we also get a lot of students who just write passionate essays about the importance of the media and understand its role and want to, to go into the media because they think it's uh, that a free and unfettered press is important, it's important for the maintenance of the Republic. Um, we've gotten a lot of students now in this political moment who just see the assault on the, on the press and the media, and they say they wanna change, the, um, change the narrative around what media is. They understand the importance of storytelling. They wanna they want change the narrative about their generation, about their communities. Um, and so being able to speak eloquently and passionately on those topics are the things that we are, that I think the university is looking for. So in other words, even though I have on the screen now that these are some good things for a student to think about if you're interested in journalism in the high school level, be it print or broadcast, having that high school editorship of a newspaper is by no means essential and by no means a guarantee uh, that you will at a school which Northwestern's admit rate, I think is about 9%. 9%, right, yes. Uh, I'm not sure what the admit rate is for Medill. Maybe you can enlighten us on that. Do you know? I actually don't know what the Medill admit rate is. Um, I, I, I literally don't know. I, I wish I, I can't give you. Uh, My suspicion is, I mean, journalism has be, become, and some people call it the Trump effect. Yes. Uh, an especially popular major now. It has. So I, 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 I imagine you have sort of uh, the pick of the litter, so to speak. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I would I would guess our admit rate is very, very close to the university's admit rate. Um, uh, I don't think it's less necessarily, but it's probably nine or ten percent as well. By the way, we are going to be taking some questions in maybe fifteen minutes. Um, so it's not essential to be an editor. It is, it is important to be interesting. In it is, absolutely. It's not essential. It is certainly helpful to be an editor, right? I mean, I will say, in terms of your experience at the school, being an editor will certainly give you a leg up as you are taking classes in Medill. Just having some familiarity with the conventions of journalism will certainly help you as a student once you are enrolled. But it is not imperative in terms of getting it be, be, being admitted. Um, again, awareness is imperative. Um, being able to articulate why you want to be in Medill is imperative. But I would say for anyone who is interested in journalism, 
um, why wouldn't you be doing it in high school, right? I mean, you know, especially now when there are so, when the barriers to being, to publishing have been pretty much eliminated. Anyone can start a blog. Anyone can sort of publish on their own. You know, why wouldn't you do that when you have so many opportunities to, to do that? I mean, I think it just, it just behooves you if you are interested to get involved early. And there's so many more opportunities now. And so many Absolutely. Than That's there. right. Where I have to ask you, you know, you can, I, mean, I hope it wasn't off the record as we'd like to say, but you said that in an email to me um, yesterday, I guess, that you had actually um, recommended a few students to the admissions committee and they had been denied. So yeah. there, there's the influence of the dean, dean of the Yeah, there's the, exactly, there's the influence um, of the dean, yes. Yeah. Um, but I guess a, a question is, you get to see these applications from time to time. And what are the ones that shine for you? Um, again, students whose application express a deep commitment to something, right? They are, again, who are able to talk about some passion that they have. And it doesn't necessarily have to be journalism, right? It actually can be something else that they have poured themselves into and are dedicated to. I think that those are the individuals who really stand out, who yeah. um, have, a again, a story to tell about um, why they're committed to this thing, again, whether it's journalism or working in a soup kitchen or whatever, um, and, and how that has shaped them as a person, how it shapes their worldview, how it shapes how they enter um, spaces. Um, yeah, those are, those are the students that really stand out. Because the nature of the school, people know that it's a selective, a highly selective institution. So generally, everyone has great grades and, and good test scores so now it's like what is the thing that's going to make you stand out and it doesn't you know you don't have to be mother teresa you don't have to be building you know uh housing for the poor it can really be something else that is very very special to you i there was a young man who once wrote about um Air, he's, he enters air guitar contest, um, there are contests for people who play air guitar. And he wrote so beautifully about why, and he was admitted, about why he loved playing air guitar. And it just sort of, again, it made him stand out. And so, again, I'm not saying you've got to manufacture some love. You know, it, it, needs, to be, it needs to be sincere. You know, it needs to come from a sincere place. But again, you know, there are all sorts of things that, that make you stand out. Well, I think the most important thing that we sort of preach to our students when we're sort of brainstorming with them about the college essay is make it be you. Yeah. Uh, make it be authentic and genuine in yes. your voice and don't try to write with $50 words. You don't need to do that. Uh, if you've gotten good ACTs or SATs, uh, you know, Northwestern uh, can tell you're smart. Yeah. Uh, write in a way, uh, you know, a good lead sentence is never a bad thing, is it? Exactly. Um, I yeah. think of uh, a story, I don't know if you read the uh, the, the terrific book um, by Jacques Sternberg, who was um, the education reporter for the New York Times, who went mm -hmm. inside of Wesleyan yes. admissions office. Yeah. And there's this poor Wesleyan admissions officer sitting out on his terrace uh, in Middletown, Connecticut, freezing in February, drinking Diet Cokes on, at 11 o'clock at night, trying to stay awake uh, as he reads applications. And I think of him and, and as a journalist, maybe, but mm -hmm. wanting to read a lead sentence from a kid in an essay that will make him put his Diet Coke down. Exactly. That's right. That's absolutely, yeah, that's wonderful advice. That's exactly what, what you want. You want to make this, this admissions officer, again, who's reading countless um, essays, looking at countless applications, you want them to sort of sit up and take notice and say, oh, this is a really interesting kid. I have to ask you, um, there has been from time to time some critics of journalism schools raising, rearing their ugly heads and saying, oh, A, you're teaching a craft, and B, all you need is a really good liberal arts education. 
uh, grounded in the humanities and the social sciences and maybe other things in order to go out and become a good journalist. Yes, you might not know how to pyramid structure and how to write a lead sentence and how to do a nice stand up and all sorts of things like that. But if you're smart, you can learn it. So therefore, Dean Whitaker, um, how would you respond? Yeah, so I hear that critique all the time, as you might imagine, <laughs> and sort of have to go out in defense of, of, uh, of journalism school. One, um, I do not shrink away from the critique that we are teaching a craft. We absolutely are. It's more art than craft, but I, I, I absolutely say we're teaching a craft and that if parents can get from their kids and if kids can get from their education that they're spending a lot of money for a tangible skill i don't think that's a horrible thing <laughs> to say oh i actually write incredibly well i can gather and synthesize information it's also a craft that has tremendous utility across lots of domains and so i, I tell people i write probably 20 law school recommendations a year for students because and all of, most of my best friends from the bill became attorneys. Um, and that's because uh, uh, journalism is a tremendous, is tremendous training for, again, gathering, synthesizing information and writing about it quickly and well. Um, and that just translates to so many other things. So again, to leave school, leave university with that skill is a wonderful thing. Um, a journalism degree at all accredited journalism schools is a liberal arts degree. It, uh, journalism, no journalism school requires you to take more than a fourth and sometimes only a third of your uh, courses in the major. Um, so it's really a liberal arts degree with a journalism overlay. That's, that's the way I describe it to people. And at Northwestern, that's because we're on the quarter system, that's a lot of liberal arts uh, classes that you get a chance to take. You have the slide up here. 80% um, of our students double major and minor in something other than journalism because there are so many classes that we you, you need um, 45 classes to graduate from Northwestern. Again, only 16 to graduate from Medill, only 16 to um, 18 of those are in Medill. The rest are elsewhere in the university. And so that gives you lots of flexibility and latitude to take a deep dive into a number of other um, uh, topics and, and uh, uh, majors. Um, and that serves our students incredibly well, both as journalists, but also in the world. Um, and what I think, but what I think journalism school does, yes, you can, anyone can start hang a shingle and call themselves a journalist. But what I think journalism school does particularly well, in addition to grounding you in the conventions of the craft, is ground you in the ethics of the craft. And again, these important conversations that we're having about journalism's role, how we should be um, operating in the world, um, too many people I know who don't come out of journalism schools and haven't been, haven't had the grounding in those ethics and um, in those principles, I think operate in ways that harm the, the, the industry. Um, and that's a great many people. Though again, it is absolutely true. You do not need a journalism degree to practice journalism, but I think people who practice journalism, who, go to, who do get a journalism degree, practice it a little differently a little more sensitively and oftentimes a little more ethically. So the world is very specialized now and journalism to a certain extent is, I mean, just witness the number of news networks, the number of different reporters within those networks. The same yeah. thing um, is the case obviously in print journalism. A, a question has come in from one of our participants about the value and necessity of um, having to specialize. Mm -hmm. um, is it important to, in addition to having a journalism degree, uh, you know, have an expertise in finance, have an expertise in aviation, have an expertise in medical research? Are those assets and are they necessary? You know, it's helpful. Um, I'd say being able, you know, when you think about putting yourself into the job market, um, you're always thinking about how you distinguish yourself as you do as a 
as an applicant for college and having um, a background, an area of expertise that you have taken a deep dive in is always helpful. It just sort of says, you know, um, I am an expert in this area. In addition to being, in, in, in addition to understanding the craft and knowing how to, to, uh, to uh, develop a, a, a news story, again, using the conventions of journalism, I also have a deep grounding in this area. That is a wonderful way to, again, distinguish yourself in the marketplace. However, um, one of the beauties of being a journalist, and I tell people this all the time uh, from my career as a journalist, is that um, at no point did I ever feel that any part of my education was useless because I covered so many things, oftentimes things that I did not have tre a tre tremendous amount of uh, knowledge about prior to going in, but I knew how to learn about those things. So I, I was on the team that covered the implantation of the first artificial heart in Louisville, Kentucky. And um, again, harking back on my very bad experiences in biology, human biology, was incredibly helpful to me in, uh, in covering those stories. And so having, you know, a broad-based liberal arts education, I think is incredibly useful as well when you are a journalist. Yeah. I have uh, to never know. In hearing you talk about all of the different things you did, I, I think one of the amazing things, and I'm sure this comes in other professions, is the high you feel after a day uh, of work or maybe after a six week investigation when you feel that you have really made a difference in some significant way. Mm -hmm. Can you talk yeah. to us about maybe a story that you did where Ooh. you sat back and you said, um, and, and it could have been just a one day story, but you yeah. know, so one, you know, one of my, a story I did very, very early in my career, surprisingly, um, was, and I spent a semester in a high school in Dade County, um, just looking at, it was the first group of students who had been through 12 years of busing in Dade County. And busing was, about, was, you know, Dade County's way of integrating schools, and yet the schools had managed to resegregate. And the school that I spent the, the semester in was a predominantly African American school. And just sort of looking at the way the district had managed to disinvest in that school, um, even though we were in this area of um, of uh, of of uh, desegregation or of integration of the school system, um, the way that school had been neglected as opposed to another school, which, uh, which a, a colleague was writing about, um, had been allowed to flourish and so sort of shining a light on that and getting the, the um, Dade County public school system to address that disinvestment was a story that I was incredibly proud of. It really so felt- there was, Yeah, so there was, um... <clears throat> something happened. Yeah, exactly. And those, those are the stories that do make you feel good when you are, again, not to, you know, not just for the sake of, of flogging and pillorying people, but really to highlight injustices in a way that you hope will ultimately make a difference. It's actually uh, yeah, quite gratifying. I don't want to talk about myself too much here, um, but I want probably the, the biggest high I had as a journalist was after almost a year long investigation, getting an innocent man out of prison in wow. Texas. He was actually pardoned for innocence uh, by the governor of Texas at the mm -hmm. time, The Last Democrat. That's a movie, The Last oh, wow. Democrat. Yeah, exactly. Was it Ann Richards? Uh, huh? Ann Richards? Who's The Last Democrat? Oh, you know, you're right. This person was, and, and he passed away recently, and now I can't remember. Oh, okay. But um, it was in 1986. Oh. Uh, but yes, Richards came after him. I'm sorry. Um, but I, I noted that for a while, Northwestern sponsored an Innocence Project, correct? We did. Uh, is that still part of the school? So the, it, that has morphed into the Medill Investigative Lab um, and is run by Debbie Sensiber, who was a Washington Post investigative reporter out of Washington, although we now, we opened, that lab used to be a two-quarter class for undergraduates in Evanston. 
um, the, the Justice Project was. Um, we've opened it up to be an investigative lab that starts with beginning investigative skills in Evanston, and then students have the opportunity to go to Washington, D.C., because we now send both undergraduates and graduate students to Washington, D.C., unlike when you and I were students and only graduate students went to Washington, D.C. Um, uh, and so now students do a wide range of investigation. It's not one of the things about doing um, wrongful conviction, which is what we used to be dedicated to right. in that program, is that those are a incredibly hard to do under any circumstances yeah. and it's really really hard to do with a group of undergraduates in only 20 weeks which is what they had to work on those right. those yeah. are investigations that often take years to find any exculpatory evidence let alone any exonerating evidence and so many times students would just feel you know like failures because they didn't find that one piece of evidence that was really going to result in either an opening up uh, and a re-examination of, of the case or an exoneration. However, through the years that we did run that program, we did find, I think, as many as 10, we had as many as 10 um, wrongful convictions uh, overturned or, or, or vacated. So. One of our participants has come up with a name. It was Texas Governor Mark White. So yes, Mark the, White. Yes. The, the. Um, another participant has asked a question. Um, if you could differentiate a journalism degree from a communications degree. So communications degrees tend to be a little more theoretical. They are they are degrees that focus on rhetoric and communication studies and media studies, um, sort of a, a panorama of things related to um, how information or entertainment is either consumed or, um, or disseminated. And journalism is really about the craft of journalism. It is about gathering and disseminating information for mass media. Um, a question again from a participant, um, and I think, of, you know, what the participant is asking is, how do you keep, uh, teach your, your kids to be objective um, <laughs> and not to let their biases and cultural perspectives uh, and predispositions uh, affect how they write a story? And I, I would will tell you that as a journalist, I think it's inevitable that we bring some of those into the field. So, so objectivity is something of a myth. <laughs> um, we, everyone comes to a story um, and their view of that story is colored by their experiences. You know, we view things through a, the lens of our experiences and there, it is very difficult for that not to affect um, how you, because the, the quotes that you choose, the way, the order in which you uh, um, choose to assemble those facts is a very subjective thing, right? And, and so it's, it's ridiculous to say that that is objectivity. What we talk about in Medill is balance and fairness a little more than objectivity. We talk about how do, how are you transparent about how you are viewing this thing, about how you collected this information, and are you making sure, are you ensuring that you have collected enough information that you are offering as, um, a, 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 you can't offer a 360 view of this topic, but as well-rounded a view of this topic as you can. You have collected enough of the sides of this topic. And, and that's difficult because I also think we sometimes get too trapped in false equivalencies in an effort to uh, make sure that all sides are heard. So, you know, somebody says the moon is made of blue cheese and someone says it isn't, and we give them equal weight and we probably should not. Um, so, but how do, you, how do you ensure that you have the best information here that reflects the most credible sides of this issue? That's what we're, we're striving for. So we're striving for some um, objectified version of truth and reality. Um, but again, understanding the limitations of quote, 
objectivity because I, I just don't I think objectivity I is interrupt you, Charles. I, I put summer programs on the screen because another participant asked about those I know and and this again just this whole issue of objectivity is we could be yes. for two hours and and it's a beautiful subject and an important subject I know the Northwestern Cherubs program has been canceled this year because of COVID it hasn't quite been canceled we've moved it online so we are doing um, a series of 10 workshops with all of the students who were admitted. Actually, we, we actually took, we did all the students who were admitted and all the students who were on the wait list. We're, you, uh, we're um, uh, going to do workshops with all of them for the summer. So right, the, the in-person program we're not holding, but we're holding a chair of light, we call it, program this summer. Uh, very quickly, um, going back to your objectivity question, then I want to talk about the employment picture for a minute um, for journalists. Um, I noted the other day that Anderson Cooper said that um, he, he never votes, uh, that that somehow might color how he approaches being a journalist. Is that something you preach to? Nope. <laughs> I, I actually do not. You know, as an African American and standing on the shoulders of people who lost their lives for enfranchisement, I could never tell someone that you don't vote. Um, not voting to me is an abdication of your responsibility as a citizen. And my, my being a journalist does not mean that I'm not a citizen of the realm. I understand that people feel that by voting, and if people know the way they vote, it somehow will color their impressions of the stories that they write. I understand that that is, a, is an occupational hazard, if you will, which is why I think we should just be, you know, not voting doesn't mean you don't have opinions about who should be president. It just means you're hiding that opinion and again, abdicating your responsibility as a citizen for not voting. I think we should be transparent about that. People should sort of know that that's how we feel, but. I would never, ever say that as a journalist, you can't vote. I, I absolutely you do. You know, though, that some believe that, um, <laughs> obviously. But uh, I understand your perspective as well. When I was a journalist, I voted uh, early and often. Um, <laughs> but um, but um, let's talk about um, your kids who are graduating and looking for jobs. I, I assume the, the job picture in light of COVID is not. This is a, yeah, this is a tough year. Um, but, 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 I, but I also wanted to ask about, you know, I think a few years ago, Warren Buffett invested in a newspaper chain. And I said to myself, what does he know that no one else does with all these newspapers? going yeah. under? I think the Times had an article this week about staff cutbacks everywhere. Uh, the Atlantic laid off 70 people um, and it just goes on and on. So what parents, Northwestern is not cheap. It is not. Um, and uh, parents might well say, well, that's a lot of money to invest um, if, if jobs aren't going to be there, if the industry, at least the print industry, is contracting. Well, the print industry is ultimately going to go away. I mean, by and large. And I, I actually have no fear about that. We are going to move, we are largely going to be a digital industry that we are just trying to figure out what the business model for that looks like. The only reason we still have print now is because in a lot of instances, print is still bringing in more revenue than digital revenue because advertisers don't pay for uh, digital advertising, what they pay for print advertising. And that is a problem of the business model. We have a business model that is so dependent on um, display and classified advertising and that is going away. Um, and we just have to acknowledge that that is going away and develop new business models. And we are in the process of developing new business models and we will ultimately be, print won't be gone entirely, but it will be a limited, uh, a, a product that is available on a very limited basis in the future. That's, that is that aside, um, I am really optimistic about, journalism is never going to go away. We will always need it. it will all, we will always have to have it. Many legacy media properties are going to go away um, and they will be replaced by a lot of other things. And again, back to the job market, our students have actually, prior to this year, this year is just, you know, it, it, all bets are off. But prior to this year, our students who wanted to go into journalism have actually been doing very well. Um, and they've been doing 
that unlike when you and I were coming out of graduate uh, of journalism school, where there was this career ladder where you went from a, a small uh, uh, local paper to a medium-sized regional paper to a big paper, our students who are really interested in going to journalism, and that's, I would say, only about 30% of our students, of our undergraduates, choose to go into journalism, which is about as much as the industry can take, right? That's the right number to be going into journalism. Um, those who do, they're starting now at the, you know, at what used to be the stretch papers and sometimes the Washington Post and the New York Times and big, web, big websites. They're starting at Politico and uh, places like Mother Jones that are doing uh, good digital work. Um, and rising from there, as opposed to this ca career ladder that used to exist, which has been obliterated. So for people who are passionate about this and really want to do it, they are actually finding a way and making a living at it. And again, doing all sorts of new and interesting things and more of those new and interesting things will develop as the business model for those develop as well. But as I alluded to earlier, um, Again, 70% of our students are going into something other than journalism, but they find that a journalism degree is wonderful training for the, a vast array of things that they choose to go into. Well, that's a very interesting question then. So if you're not the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Chicago Tribune, and you're Exxon, or you're a nonprofit, or you're yeah. someone else, what are you seeing from your perspective in a, a 21 or 22 year old uh, journalism grad, what, what is the value of that degree? Someone who understands- Outside of journalism. Someone who understands storytelling and how to connect with audiences. Everyone has an audience that they need to connect with. Everyone has a story that they need to tell. Um, and that's what journalists are trained to do. Everyone needs someone who can gather information and again, process and synthesize that information and distribute it. Um, and that's what journalists are trained to do. Um, and that's the value that people are seeing in, in our students. Um, I, I think we, uh, you've been wonderful and I thank you. I, I, I do have to ask you about your sense of uh, journalism under threat and the First Amendment under threat. Um, there, you know, we can be a bit prickly about it and talk about slippery slopes all the time. Um, what, what do you foresee ahead of us, especially if President Trump is reelected? I don't have a crystal ball, <laughs> so I don't know what's ahead of us. But I will say, and I've been preaching this for a long time, um, it is really important for us, and I think it's important for journalism schools, it's important for journalists to help the public see. We take for granted that everyone understands the importance of the First Amendment. People pay lip service to it all the time. And, and um, people pay lip service to the idea that there should be a free press. But they absolutely have no idea what that really means and how that should be practiced and how fragile a concept that is. Um, and what should we be, what we should be doing to maintain it and protect it. And we've been terrible. We've been so arrogant in our belief that everyone understands that, that we haven't talked about it very much ourselves. And so I, as a journalism dean, as someone who really believes in that concept, feels that I have a responsibility to be out there, as I said, evangelizing for the First Amendment, evangelizing for a free press, talking about why this is so important for the maintenance of democracy. We cannot take, we can no longer take for granted that that is a given. We need to have that education happen in our schools at a very young age. We need more media literacy. We need to talk, we need to um, teach young people to read critically. Um, they're gonna get, they get a lot of information uh, via the internet, much of it, you know, completely useless. And we need to help them figure out how to discern good from bad information, how to under, how to look at sourcing and, and understand whether or not this is a credible report. 
Um, and if we don't do that, then again, I have no crystal ball, but I will say if we don't take up that mantle, if we don't take up that charge, then the, then the press will certainly be, uh, the threat that we are feeling will be a real one and will, will be realized. Any final uh, sage words of advice for those high school students and parents who might be watching today and, and contemplating uh, a career in journalism and a path toward an excellent school such as Medill? You know, I, I, I tell young people all the time, if you're interested in journalism, um, then try reading some journalism or, or consuming some journalism, you know? there's there's you know, as much as we wring our hands about the state of journalism today, there is wonderful journalism out there that is being practiced every day by some amazing, in, in some amazing places, not just at the New York Times and the Washington Post, but at a lot of other really credible websites and, web, and, and sources. And so, you know, take a deep dive, go out and look at it, try to read it, not just like a consumer, but try to read it, um, uh, try to analyze it and dissect it and read it uh, like a, to do a more discerning read of it. Um, think about what your place might be in media and what you might, you know, the kinds of journalism that you may want to do. Dream of, about that. You may not get a chance to do it. You certainly may not get a chance to do it immediately out of school, but think about what the possibilities are and where you could see yourself, um, you could see insinuating yourself in this orbit that we call journalism. Um, I think that, yeah, that's the best advice that I can give. Dean Waterford, I want to thank you. Thank um, you, Andy. For those of you who are um, joining us, um, if you have additional questions about journalism, I was a journalist for a number of years, and if you have additional questions about journalism and college counseling, uh, I'd be happy to talk to you uh, about both or one or the other. Uh, we are offering a free consultation until the middle of June, so I hope you don't mind a little bit of marketing in here, Dean, um, just for a minute. But I do uh, want to thank you. It really is uh, deeply encouraging to me as, as an alum to see our alma mater in uh, being steered by such a a, a good captain, if you will. You're, you're much too kind, Andy. I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, and folks out there, um, it's an hour, free hour consultation, and I hope you'll you'll do that. And uh, I hope perhaps at another time we can come back and and have another discussion about the state of journalism. I would love to uh, call me anytime. All right, thank you, Charles. Thank you. Take care.